Hey guys, this is Nurse Howie, and it's the first time I shadowed a CRNA. By the way, you might see Remy. Uh, here he is. <laughs> Hi, baby. I uh, just adopted him a couple months ago, about six months ago, prior to my last travel assignment. So, say hi, Remy. Say hi to the camera. Be pretty obedient, but it's gonna take a while. Anyway, um, are you gonna sit next to me or sit next to me, Remy? Sit. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, hey, CRNA, it seems to be the normal transition from being an ICU nurse. And because I'm not seeing a lot of um, minority CRNAs, and um, speaking of that, um, ah, you just sat on my nuts. Ow, Remy, he's very attentive lately. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of minority CRNAs, nor am I seeing a lot of vocally um, LGBT CRNAs. So I figured I might as well start making some videos now. You know me, I try to make some videos, but um, I'm not as consistent as I try to be. So I'm going to try to be more consistent um, now that I have more stuff to talk about. So being a CRNA is a little bit difficult because it's very selective. Um, those of you know that I used to want to become a psychiatric nurse practitioner and things just didn't happen. I'll talk about that in a different video, but long story short, I had a very bad preceptor that basically just made me do office work and um, not really see any patients. And on top of that, when I was talking to a lot of other psych nurse practitioners, specifically online, they were very defensive about their job. And I'm seeing some videos, most notably a couple of videos I'm going to note here. Uh, I think his name is David Warren, NP, and he was, seems to be a very talented nurse practitioner. He seemed to be complaining a lot about not being able to find jobs. And he was a very good nurse practitioner from what he sounded like. And he was picking up um, locum tenens travel MP position. So basically he was a travel MP instead of a travel um, ICU nurse like I am. He was a travel nurse practitioner. And so he was making some decent money. Basically the same as I was, but he was a nurse practitioner and he had to go all the way to Alaska. But as you know, COVID happened and it upended everybody's lives. So while I was going for psychiatric nurse practitioner, I ended up not really getting along with my preceptor. I was doing fine in my coursework, but something was really digging into me. Um, I was online and I was defending a lot of uh, these nurse practitioners that went from uh, straight from nursing to straight nurse practitioner after like one year. Now there's a lot of talk about people not having enough experience before applying to become nurse practitioner. But to me, if you're like older and you've had a couple of um, careers already, you want to go straight to nurse practitioner, I say go for it. You know, don't let anybody stop you. Um, people didn't stop other nurses when they were going straight to ICU for med surge. So why should you stop people from going straight to nurse practitioner to, to whatever, you know, from being a nurse? But I do understand that there are some nurse practitioners out there that don't even know how to insert an NG tube, and it seems kind of embarrassing. But you wouldn't ask a PA to insert a nurse, uh, an NG tube, would you? But they try to make up for it other ways. Um, there is also a lot of politics when it comes to nurse practitioners. You can't go and switch from a different um, field. For example, there's a lot of family nurse practitioners out there. Um, the reason why is because a lot of family nurse practitioners can switch over to um, being... Let me make sure this recording is on. All right, where was I? Oh, so a lot of these psych nurse practitioners are very defensive. If you try to come into their program, they're going to be um, mad at you. They're going to say you don't have enough experience, you're not good enough. Um, and here's why. So I kind of got tired of that. I kind of felt bad. Like, I feel like you should be able to be judged based on your merit, not on your past discourse or your past um, experiences. Um, 
you should be able to learn because when everybody starts becoming a, uh, a nurse practitioner, you get that imposter syndrome and you really have to learn and learn and learn. And everybody says that, you know, up to date is going to be your best friend. Well, duh, because up to date has all the current um, information that you're supposed to know in, a, in, a, in order to treat a patient. But really, it takes like uh, seeing multiple patients over and over again to be able to really get the hang of becoming a nurse practitioner no matter what demographic you are, but let me get off my soapbox. I shadowed nurse practitioners today. There was a little bit of a difference. I decided to become an, um, a CRNA instead of a, nurse, a psychiatric nurse practitioner because even though I like psychiatry, um, I did not like my preceptor and I did not like where the field is going, going to. Um, and it's a little bit hard to become a CRNA because everybody has to become an ICU nurse and that in and of itself is hard enough to get to. So. I had, it all started a long time ago, before I even uh, got my nursing degree, it all, it, uh, I had a, a friend that was like in CrossFit when CrossFit was cool back in the day. Um, now it's not, <laughs> politically wise. So um, anyway, she was in the same gym as I was and she just remembered me, me wanting to become an, an RN and she said, how, you know, you should really try and see what my job is like. And I was like, oh, what do you do? And she goes, well, I'm a CRNA in the military. And I said, oh, I don't wanna go back to the military. I already did my six years. I don't wanna go back. Um, but I did like the fact that she was doing um, nurse anesthetist. And everybody knows that pays a lot of money. So um, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm barely even an ICU. Um, I got, I was working in an LTAC at the time, which had drips and ventilators, and um, but a lot of people don't see that as real ICU, and but that's a whole different video also, a whole more different kind of politics that you have to get over. Um, but I had gotten an externship from this large university teaching hospital that was teaching me how to become an ICU nurse. Of course, they were doing it for free, which means that I wasn't getting paid because it was an externship, which is, means that it was getting extra teaching and training to become an ICU nurse after I had graduated from school. So it was fun. I had a couple, you know, I had a little bit of money saved over and I didn't need to get paid. Um, so I did it on the side. Um, I was just happy to have that critical care experience and I was shadowed um, by a preceptor, a formal preceptor, and I did my best because I, was trying to see if they would hire me. Long story short, they really weren't looking to hire any new grads into the specific ICU because this neuro ICU is very, very specialized. Um, um, they ended up actually pulling me in for an interview like a year later, but um, passed me over because it was like 200 applicants. They said I was like up there, but um, the person that had beaten me, there was only one position. See how that's competitive? Nursing is competitive in Southern California. It was one position and she had more uh, ICU experience than me. So there you go. Um, so I took that to heart and that, that sucked because I had worked in that specific unit and I was hoping to get an upper hand because I already knew how the unit was. But you know, things happen the way they are. Um, I had a couple of rejections from ICU anyway. So it was another rejection. You just have to have tough skin. So anyway, this CRNA had been watching my career for years without me knowing. I mean, she was a Facebook friend, but I thought nothing of it. I thought she was the sweetest, sweetest lady. Um, she was badass, I thought, because she could kick butt. I mean, she was more of a runner than a weightlifter, but I knew she was very tough. But she was tough in that she was strong and kind and quiet. She was very stoic, you know, like very calm. And I wasn't sure if that was her personality or something that she had gotten as a nurse anesthetist. So years and years go by. Um, you can follow my journey that I finally make it to the ICU. Um, and it was during COVID times. You know, I did, I worked from the bottom. I worked before I even went to nursing school. I was a corpsman, I was a medic, I did per diem. I was an LVN. I worked. I was in the LVN, supported myself to community college, got my first degree in biochemistry. That didn't work out in pharmacy school. I just didn't, I, I needed to talk to people. After that, um, I went and got my BSN. And after my BSN, I started going to nurse practitioner and then psych nurse practitioner. And that didn't work out. And she had watched my career from the bottom to the top. And I was talking to her again. 
and she was seeing all these posts that I was saying, oh, I'm taking care of a patient um, in tele, because I started off from med surge and then I went to telemetry and then from telemetry I went to step down and PCU and then I started going to ICU and she watched my career and she would see my posts and she said, Howie, I really think that you have a penchant for this, for being a, um, you know, for my job. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'm never going to make it to ICU or even if I did, I'm never going to go to the CRNA because I'm not going to go with the military because it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to cost for more graduate coursework. And I'm still trying to pay off my loans from BSN and from NP that I didn't even finish. Ugh. So I thought nothing of it, but I kept running into her and she kept asking me and asking me saying that you want to try it? Do you want to try it? Finally, I dropped out of my psych MP program and I said, okay, let's do it. So I did, and she offered to, um, you know, I was going, I was finish up, finishing up my last uh, COVID ICU contract in North Dakota. And, um, you know, I, the vaccine was coming around, so I'm, I was hoping that the vaccine, that the COVID count was gonna go down because mentally I was getting tired. Um, mentally, it was just getting sad, just seeing these people die left and right, and I was trying to become numb. Um, so I was looking for my way out of the ICU, even though I do love the ICU. Um, even if I don't go to the CRNA, I would still probably work the ICU, but it does get you. Um, so I emailed her and I said, hey, so I'm gonna be done with my North Dakota um, COVID ICU contract in about a couple weeks. I was wondering if you wanted to see if I could be allowed to shadow you. And she said, sure. There's a couple of a bit more COVID restrictions, but I don't, hopefully it won't be a problem. I said, I understand. Um, I'm just very appreciative of the opportunity. Um, if you'll let me shadow you, I'll be more than happy to. So she said, I will let you know. And I said, okay. So um, I kind of forgot about it for a couple of weeks. Um, and then she texted me again. And then she said, hey, I got the, the clearance from um, my bosses and um, you don't have to apply for a card since you're a veteran and you're in the mil um, and I'm in the military so we're just gonna have you come in and I've got you a scrub card so you can change it to some OR scrubs and you can watch and I said great now I'm sure I have been shadowed by a couple of um, regular civilian nursing students before and I know that they're um, schooling has been derailed quite a bit by COVID ICU. So I know there's a lot of like, um, you know, like obstacles, but if you just persist, hopefully things will happen for you. And I think most of my career has just been me persisting. Not so much being me being intelligent or me being um, uh, clever, but just me just persisting. Keep trying it, keep trying it, go on. And I think that's the majority of my um, progress. Not so much my success, but my progress in my career. So here's where we're at uh, with the COVID shadowing. I mean, sorry, the CRNA shadowing. I decided to do, of course, to do some research prior to going in. Where are we? Where was I? Okay, so the first thing I did was research what it was like to shadow a nurse practitioner. Now, this time, I have already researched the schools. There's quite a lot of schools. Um, basically, all of them require that you shadow a CRNA prior to even trying to apply to their school. And some um, schools, for example, Kaiser, require at least eight hours, and then, but they don't say the cap, whereas other schools also put in the cap for like 50 or so hours. So. Um, I've read a couple of people who are successful say that they try to shadow for around 40 hours. And to me, about a week's worth of shadowing is pretty um, uh, reasonable. Um, sometimes I felt like uh, my CRNA mentor was very, uh, uh, she believed in me and then she sounded like she was open to letting me be able to shadow about 40 hours. Um, depending on her schedule and she was even willing to send me information on other crnas from different institutions um, for me to be able to get that much experience because if you can shadow other crnas great it was awesome because she was up to her eyeballs in shadowing um in precepting because she was not only precepting me 
or letting me shadow, but she was precepting an actual CRNA student who was set to graduate from the military, which is one of the top anesthesia programs. Um, she was precepting her. Uh, she was about ready to take the uh, licensing examination, LLE, or anesthesia in about three months. So, you know, she had her eyeballs full with watching two people and patient and, you know, a couple of surgeries and all that. And on top of that, she was a high-ranking uh, officer in the military. So she had a lot of responsibilities and she was getting ready to move. So I didn't want to get in her way. So I wanted to make sure that I was prepared. Um, the next thing I saw was that there was a couple of, of forms that you can find online. I can send you these links um, up, put on my website. But basically, um, it seems like everybody copies the one from Kaiser. Here's what they want for you to, to know when you're shadowing somebody. They want you to know about nine things. One, uh, be able to see that how CRNAs discuss the roles and responsibilities of a CRNA. Two, observe preoperative assessment and patient preparation. This is more important than you think. Three, observed induction of general anesthesia. You might not always find that. Uh, four, observed invasive line placement. You probably already saw that as an ICU nurse. Probably, I saw it a lot during COVID when we intubated people. We, I usually ask them to put an art line too, so I, already, I always saw that. Um, five, observed regional anesthesia. Um, there's more of a move towards regional anesthesia versus general anesthesia, but general anesthesia is still important because of emergencies, I found. Um, six, observed intraoperative monitoring and anesthetic management. So again, if you're an ICU nurse, you know what it's like to monitor a patient, especially during critical uh, patients that are, are critically unstable. Um, seven, observed emergence from general anesthesia. Eight, observed post-operative assessment and handoff. And nine, other experiences. Um, so again, I'll put that in a form that I found, uh, or I'll link it to a general form that I also found from CRNA CAPT, I think. Um, and uh, you can download the link and then bring it to your site. Uh, but for the most part, Kaiser's CRNA shadowing is pretty uh, self-explanatory and you can just go off of that template. Um, and then it just has an option for your CRNA preceptor to sign and um, their address, email address, so they can contact them to verify that you're, you had all the shadowing hours. So these are the things that I learned on CRNA shadow day one. Um, this might not be the same for you, but this was what happened to me. Um, and the biggest thing I wanted you to know is that I did not observe general anesthesia because again, uh, my preceptor or CRNA shadow, I CRNA mentor was really big on not using general anesthesia. Um, I guess we're trying to use more of a, um, either a block anesthesia or epidurals, or now I found out it's pericapsular per nerve group blocks and um, spinal blocks rather than general anesthesia because even though you're putting the patient under, it's a little bit harder and you put the patient more at risk for more complications if you put them on general anesthesia. So I didn't see that at the first day, but definitely knew that it was important not to just slap snow everybody <laughs> with general anesthesia. That's no longer the trend. It's um, it's out of fashion. So today, uh, keep in mind this is like eight pages long, so <laughs> I'm just gonna try to go through it pretty quickly. Um, one, I knew how, I found out how to assess the room, uh, the OR room, it's similar to my ICU room, but a little bit different because it was an Apollo Draeger. I saw that there was a Jackson Reese circuit, which I need to study later. I learned how to assess my room, check out to see where the O2, IV, EKG, and AMU bag was. Um, I saw how the ETCO2 ventilator and suction machine worked, um, as well as the monitoring equipment um, and how that was done. Um, I saw uh, the inhale inhaled gases, acylflurane and cephalflurane, and I'm gonna have to read up on why that's important and why that was um, built into the Apollo Draeger machine. And also CRNAs are big on backup planning. Um, I saw that there was an airway tray with different oropharyngeal airways. 
and that's Remy, he's snoring. And um, also different ETTs um, just for emergencies, as well as knowing what your uh, electrical supply will be if in case there was a blackout. Then we went to go pre-assess a surgical patient. Um, this, I ran into a couple, or they ran into a little bit of politics because the OR nurse was also shadowing, was also precepting somebody, and she was taking a little bit longer, but everybody has to consent the patient. Um, it seems like the patient gets kind of tired of it, but um, the PAC unit or the, you know, the surgical nurse preps and consents the patient and the surgeon consents the patient first then the OR nurse goes in there and then we go in and the CRNAs go in there and then the residents and the physicians and the, then the surgeon goes back in there and just everybody reconsents patients, retoxes them um, and so the patient gets kind of sick of it but it's just for their own good because that way we need to know that everybody's safe and everybody's on the same page. So what we did was we verified the demographics of the patient. We had him say his birthday again, name, full name, allergies, allergies, allergies. Um, this was important because when we were doing timeout in the OR, um, they would always ask the CRNAs exactly what the allergies were. And when I was reading the books, it showed that you really want to know if the patient has severe allergic reactions or if it's just like a sensitivity. But I already do that as a nurse anyway. You also want to ask the patient what surgery are you having because this helps them to determine what their understanding of the surgery is. And if it's wrong, something's wrong. Um, and then you want to consent, review, and overview. We also want to make sure that the consent is signed, but we also want to make sure that our anesthesia consent is signed and that the general anesthesia consent is signed on top of regional anesthesia because if there's a problem with the regional anesthesia and the patient starts to experience too much pain or starts to wake up, um, you might want to just put them on complete general anesthesia as a backup because remember, CRNAs are big on backups. Um, you want to explain the different types of anesthesia, sedative anesthesia, awake versus general anesthesia versus monitored um, anesthesia control, stuff like that. And you want to ensure signatures are all correctly filled and all signed and ensure that the body is marked if your surgery is going to be on a certain body part. Uh, you also want to ask about tobacco, alcohol use, and drug use um, for varying different reasons to see if the patient has a bad airway or if the patient might not react to a certain drugs, specifically if it's like opioids and they might have a higher tolerance maybe. Again, I'm not a CRNA. I'm just shadowing, so these are things I'm thinking about. Uh, prior surgeries, including prior anesthesia, did the patient have any reaction to the anesthesia? What kind of anesthesia did they have a reaction to? And did there, any of their family have any reactions to anesthesia or did they have any history? The reason why we sus, try to figure that out because we're trying to suss out the proclivity to malignant hyperthermia. It's rare, but it happens. Uh, we also want to know medication history, including erectile dysfunction medications that they used. When was the last time they used it? Um, we just want to make sure that, you know, if blood pressure goes down, we might be able to figure out what the problem is. Any other medical history like obstructive sleep apnea or snoring, did they use CPAP machine or use an O2 use at home? Any palpitations, murmurs, or shortness of breath um, cardiac wise? So they have shortness of breath when walking up a flight of stairs. Um, it might not even be a cardiac problem. They might even have a airway respiratory problem that we want to know about, we want to know about prior to them going into the OR. Um, any reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, any other GI problems, any other thyroid or other metabolic diseases, weakness, nerve or musculoskeletal issues, any mental health issues, anything else at all that we um, might have missed or the patient would like to mention. Then we perform an oral exam, very important apparently. You have to ask the patient to sit up, you assess the uvula in the pharynx. You ask about dentures. Do they have any? Is it top or bottom or both? Are they wearing the dentures now? Do they have any loose teeth or anything like that? Are they wearing any false teeth? Ask the patient to perform chin to chest procedure. Have patient do neck range of motion. Any problems with that? Do they have a short neck? Evaluate to see if the patient can hinge or unhinge the jawline. You might need to, you might need to use that in order to facilitate a better airway during an emergency. Next, we prep the patient in the OR. So we start the anesthesia working workstation machines. You log into your PICSIS and you make sure your EHR is ready to go. That's your electronic health record. Um, then you place monitoring capabilities. Definitely always have these, which is heart rate, blood pressure, EKG, temperature, FICO2 or FIO2, and ETCO2. 
I'm sorry, FiO2 and FiCO2. All important stuff. Uh, then you position them for spinal anesthesia or whatever anesthesia that you're trying to do. If it's regional, um, like an epidural or spinal, of course, you're going to have them sit up or um, maybe go into, I think, a Sims position or whatever. Then you prepare your medication. You check what anesthetics that you want to use, local anesthetics. You'd want to do preloading versus co-loading or with co-loading. I don't know what those are, but that's what they mentioned. Um, look at lidocaine or bupivocaine. Um, she asked me, why can't we mix it with lidocaine? Well, I read into the textbook that lidocaine has a lot of side effects. It works very well, but it has a lot of side effects. So that's why we, people try to mix it um, with different um, local anesthetics. So accumulated data suggests that the incidence of transient neuro neurological symptoms, TNS, appears to be higher with lidocaine than with other local anesthetics. Um, check out Hample 1999. So uh, mixing with Expiro, Expiro may facilitate slow release if you want to also adjust the release of the pain and um, um, the anesthetic. But be mindful of toxicity levels. The surgeon might not be thinking about how much anesthesia you've been giving. It's up to you to be able to know exactly how much anesthesia you've been giving to the patient throughout the entire surgery, lest they become um, reactive to all the anesthesia that you gave them. So note some anesthesia will decrease baseline map by 20%, so just be aware of that. Um, but you also know that, I also know that from um, intubating people during emergencies during COVID. Um, that's why we have like neo sticks uh, to be able to bring patients' blood pressures up in case it goes down. So note that early signs of pain may happen upon first incision. So keep an eye out for the monitor or um, and the vital changes, as well as patient facial grimaces or facial movements or body movements um, during the first incision because we, when they do that first cut you don't want to miss it and you don't want to lose that small um, very quick sign that the patient might be having pain because even though those are sedated everybody I see you nurses should always know this even though a patient is sedated does not mean that they're pain free same thing with paralysis um, just because somebody is paralyzed doesn't mean that they're sedated um, analgesics include ketamine and fentanyl. Try to avoid, they're trying to avoid fentanyl drips now, so they're trying to just give it like every two hours or so. Um, then tranexemic acid, TXA, uh, is used for bleeding control. Um, I've, I've never seen that used. I've heard of it, but I've never seen that used. Apparently it's really popular in the OR. And then propofol and neo are always hung up on a drip. So those are I'm very familiar with in the ICU. Um, so you should hide those and get those ready to go and have a couple of bottles ready and always available. And also have your reversal agents, neostigmine and glycopyrrolate. These medications will help block certain nicotinic versus muscarinic receptors in order to competitively bind the receptor inhibitor. I had to reread that on my biochemistry. Um, then also have your bear huggers, blankets, and drapes ready to make sure the patient stays warm. Positioners, foam, pegboard, and any extra airways. Um, so instead of general anesthesia, I really witnessed a couple of very interesting neuraxial blocks. One is spinal anesthesia, uh, which is the technique of the two pops technique where the um, CRNA student uh, put in the, uh, a needle, the spinal uh, epidural needle, and then she first felt that pop and then a release. And it signified the penetration of the ligamentum flavum in the spinal cord or in the spinal cord area and the second penetration of the dura arachnoid membrane you want to be able to find a sweet spot in between um, then she I also witnessed epidural anesthesia and a lot of you um, labor labored ladies know what I'm talking about um, so the epidural catheter is allowed for a continuous infusion or intermittent bolus so it may also allow for a decreased dose to be used when a patient for example is undergoing labor needs anesthesia must still be able to feel um, contractions so there's two things. We want to do the epidural. Um, so when they put the needle in and they put the anesthesia in, the CRNA does this. Uh, she also wants to slide an epidural catheter to leave it there so we can plug into it later on, maybe after the OR surgery, um, and then be able to use that catheter to infuse anesthesia into the patient later. Um, so allow some of you, you know, ladies with kids know what I'm talking about. Um, it's also a good idea to use epidural, apparently, if you want to be able to anesthetize somebody but not completely block them. Just like you want to do a lighter anesthesia or you want to do it with different degrees. Because, for example, if you want to uh, control a patient's, um, a laboring woman's pain, but then, or man, uh, whoever's laboring, 
laboring patient's pain, but then you don't want to completely erase their feeling of labor because you want them to know when they're having true labor, then you want to do the epidural. There's also the loss of resistance technique, and that's when the lumbar of the epidural needle is advanced through the subcutaneous tissue with a stylet in place until the ligamentous flavum is entered, which is felt with an increase in tissue resistance. So the stylet or the introducer is removed, and the glass syringe is filled with two milliliters of nasal um, normal saline fluid is attached to the hub of the needle. And then the tip of the needle is within the ligament, and then you don't want to go in too far, but you just want to be able to get the sweet spot. So you start to see where the pressure is, and then you do a little bit of um, gentle saline bites, is what she called it. So you keep pushing with a cup of the very small amounts of um, saline into the needle with resistance and see if injection is not or is possible. Um, when the, and then if it's not possible, then slowly advance the needle very small by a milliliter by milliliter and keep trying those saline bites to see if you hit the sweet spot. And then once the needle enters the epidural space, which is the potential space, there's a sudden loss of resistance and the injection is easy. Now, note that the epidural space is a man-made concept. It is not um, inherent in human anatomy, but it's something that we make as anesthetists so that we can put in um, anesthesia. Um, it does, and apparently what we found out is that if the patient is like older or if they have had previous surgery in the lumbar or wherever you're putting that epidural, um, try not to withdraw too much, um, otherwise you might not be able to find that space again, so be careful. Uh, but we do sometimes uh, withdraw, and I feel bad because I think they did it for my sake, but um, the CRNA student withdrew a little bit to make sure that, that what she found was actual CSF. And for some other reason, I thought CSF was like pale yellow, <laughs> but apparently if CSF is pale yellow, you're in trouble because the patient has like meningitis or something. <laughs> it's, it's completely infected. But CSF is really pure and clear, but it's a different viscosity as normal saline. So they're both clear, but if you mix uh, and withdraw a little bit of CSF into your needle filled with saline, you'll see a little swirl. And that tells you that you have CSF um, and that you're in the right spot. So I also saw a peripheral nerve block, uh, which was really cool. I don't know if that falls under, um, I'm sorry, I saw a per pericapsular nerve block, which they call a PENG, P-E-N-G. I don't know if that serves as falls on the, under the umbrella of a peripheral nerve block, but it's a newer regional anesthetic technique developed for total hip arthroplasties, or in my case, it was a um, semi-hemi-arthroplasty, for post-op analgesia with motor sparing benefits. It is supposed to provide more complete analgesia to the hip by depositing local anesthetic within the myofascial plane of the psoas muscle and superior pubic ramus. So they're trying this um, sweet old lady was uh, an older lady and of course we didn't want to put her under general anesthesia because again we're trying to fall away from that so we did this peripheral uh, pericapsular nerve block this ping and so we uh, I saw the anesthesiologist use uh, ultrasound which I'm trying to learn on my own um, and they were trying to find these nerves that bundle together apparently nerves bundle together along with the veins and the arteries and um, near a specific part of the hip um, I think that occipital fossa or something um, just with an O uh, is where you want to hit and able to be able to get a regional anesthesia for the rest of the lower leg and the hip because you're trying to make everything um, numb so they could do the surgery so this is this technique is common in the elderly population. This pain, which are more tolerant of general, more intolerant of general anesthesia, especially if they have history of dementia. So hip joint is supplied by femoral sciatic and obturator nerve. Obturator, that's what it was. The latter being the target, which is the obturator. The indication for pain is for post-operative pain control for surgery at the hip joint for management of post-surgical pain associated with fractures of proximal femur femoral head. So what was interesting to me was the ultra, the, also the ultrasound technique. So they placed the patient's spine prior to her going to the OR. They put a wand on the transverse plane with a superior iliac spine, ASIS is what they call it, and aligned it with the pubic ramus and rotated it counterclockwise 45 degrees parallel to the inguinal crease around here. 
and then they slid it immediately along the axis until the bony landmarks, the A AIIS, the IPE, and the psoas tendon were identified. Um, there were like three little holes, and then one hole you could tell was a vein because it was easily collapsible, and the one was not, so that was the artery. So they slid the wand distally, the gently tilting caudal head. They gently tilted the caudal uh, to expose the femoral head, then returned to initial starting position. A standard 20 gauge 100 millimeter needle was inserted in plane from lateral to medial. Try to avert the patient's away, eyes away because even though the 20 gauge needle wasn't that big, it was long and scary. <laughs> um, so insert the needle in plane from lateral to medial sort of closer to the center, in plane between the psoas tendon and the pubic ramus. And then uh, 15, 20 mils of 5% ropivocaine or other long-lasting anesthetic is then deposited into the plane, lifting the psoas tendon. Do not puncture the psoas tendon though. Interesting. Um, I got a couple more, a couple more paragraphs, so um, just three more. So the first one is multinodal anesthesia is again a movement to decrease opioid dependence and side effects and complication by avoiding incriminating medications and anesthetic procedures purely for the sake of ease and convenience. So we're trying to stay away from um, general anesthesia. We're trying to be more holistic and trying different ways to anesthetize somebody rather than snowing them completely from head to toe. Um, so I guess in nurse anesthesia school, we're going to learn how to mix medications for that better optimiz optimization. That sounds fun. Um, nursing considerations, advocate for your patient. Every nurse, every good nurse should know how to do that. Um, but it's easier said than done. So here's some things to know is that you should know your anesthesia medications well so that you know the best combination of meds to administer to your patient while mitigating the side effects and adverse reactions. And then track medications to monitor toxicity. Advocate for your patient if it's too much anesthesia is requested. And um, bed ulcers are still rampant in the OR table. Make sure the patient moves, um, even in the OR, even in Apparently hair can still cause sores on the head, so be careful. Ensure that your patient gets turned every two hours or so. Um, practice critical thinking. Think about how to adjust anesthesia based on the patient's chronic versus acute organic disease. So again, probably learned that in school. And finally, miscellaneous things like the Bezold Jarish reflex is what the CRNA student told me. And um, is one of the many things that she prepared for when a patient was being anesthetized. Um, it is a reflex that responds to noxious ventricular stimuli sensed by chemoreceptors and me mechanoreceptors within the LV wall by inducing the triad of hypotension bradycardia and coronary artery dilation. dilatation. The activated receptors communicate along unmyelinated vagal afferent type C fibers. So I need to review research why Zofran mitigates that. Zofran means to be a wonder drug nowadays. Everybody uses it for whoa, everything off-label. And what other medications are used off-label? I don't know. So, um, and then I put on a list of things that I still need to see. So I told her I still need to see an observed induction of general anesthesia, even though it's dangerous. And I still need to see observed invasive line placement in the OR, even though I've seen it like countless a few times already, and observed emergence from general anesthesia. And that, my friends, was my first day shadowing in the OR as a CRNA shadow possible applicant. Hope, hope. Um, if you have any questions, sorry I talk really fast. I just want to make this not a completely super duper long video. Um, but yeah, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, hit the bell button for notification. Um, let me know what you want to see in the comments, what you like, what you didn't like. Please be nice. <laughs> and um, I will see you next time on Nurse Howie. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Say bye to Remy. Bye, Remy. Bye, buddy. <laughs> I'm a good boy.